Base is dropped on soccer's morning show. It is another go round of soccer down here. Thursday thoughts. John here, you there. And uh, traffic this morning is we got stuff to talk about, obviously. Uh, MLS schedule came out yesterday afternoon. Once again, this is what happens when you don't have an afternoon drive show. So we'll talk about that this morning. Uh, Nico Moreno should be uh, joining us at 1030 for Thursdays with Nico. We'll get his uh, pre-Christmas thoughts on everything, coaching carousel and the schedule and all that kind of stuff. And we will we'll talk about that. Uh, but there will be a pre there will be a, a predominant topic this morning. And it came while we were sleeping. Morning ropes, morning Dell. And it's the return of, you know, it, it literally it's like the the you know, it, it's the topic that won't go away. And I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. And uh, it's the return of something that we talked about a very long time ago. So if that gives you a hint, you know where we're heading. All right. Opening kickoff brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee. KickoffCoffeeCO.com. That's your QR code for those of you who are watching either on the YouTube channel, on the Twitch, or on the 280 character app. And with the Kickoff Coffee, once again, use the code uh, Soccer Down Here 15. You get 15% off your purchase. They, in turn, take 10% reinvested into the youth game and youth initiatives that they have earmarked for coolness. Once again, that's our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. And thanks to all of you who have been uh, kicking off your morning with uh, our friends at Kickoff Coffee. Michael Valverde definitely does that on a seemingly on a daily basis. All right. Uh, yesterday, it's an Atlanta United note. Uh, yesterday, we found out through uh, social media a couple of players. Uh, David Mejia, Johnny Vial, that we've been following the last handful of seasons and it looks like they have found new homes for 2024. Uh, David Mejia looks like he is going to be a part of the, the early season maneuverings of the Miami FC in USL Championship. Not A, but the Miami FC. Can't just be A Miami FC. It is the specific the Miami FC. So uh, David Mejia looks like he's going to be a part of things at Ricardo Silva this year. And uh, Johnny Vial, it uh, looks like... Johnny Vial might be uh, heading to Atletico San Luis in Liga MX. And for Atlanta United, once again, a fantastic piece of business. And we talk about uh, having, you know, we, we've had the discussion yesterday about folks who have not had the opportunity to, you know, ha- get first team minutes, or if they have, it's been very, very limited. And when someone comes knocking on your door and they sit there and they have an interest, and they want to sit there and go, hey, yo, here's, you know, here's a here's some here's some financial considerations for this particular individual. And you get the opportunity to say, well, sure. The deal apparently with the David Mejia and uh, Atlanta United and Atletico San Luis. Johnny Vial gets uh, to move to Atleti. And Atlanta United gets a piece of the pass. They've maintained, they've held on to a piece of the pass for Johnny Vial. So I don't know the financials. I have to look them up. But the the understanding is is that it is not a full purchase for Johnny Vial. Atlanta United gets to hang on to a percentage of the pass for Johnny Vial uh, ad infinitum. Until further notice, unless somebody really just wants to cut him a large check and sit there and it's like, all right. You know, it, you can absolve yourself of all rights and futures of Johnny Vial. But Johnny Vial looks like he's going to be heading to Atletico San Luis in Liga MX. David Mejia to the Miami FC. So two young, talented players for Atlanta United moving on for 2024. And it will be, once again, uh, interesting to see how they continue to uh, grow their games and see how they continue to to advance their games starting in 2024. David Mejia, USL Championship. And it looks like Johnny Vial, the Liga MX. So very, very cool stuff there as we go. Morning, Sam. Welcome back. Welcome back. 
So that's your opening kickoff. Keep an eye on the, the futures for a couple of Atlanta United players that have moved on to uh, USL Championship and Liga MX. So that's your opening kickoff. Brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee, kickoffcoffeeco.com. Once again, there's your QR code for those of you who are watching either on the YouTubes, the Twitch, or the 280-character app. Don't forget to use the code SOCCER down here, 15. You get 15% off your purchase. They, in turn, take 10%, reinvested into the youth game and youth initiatives that they consider to be cool. Now he needs Carlito with an apple. Once again, that's our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. Okay. Morning, Tom. Morning, Emilio. <laughs> Inter Miami, you have 15 DPs. I know. Um, this is the other team. The, the other team in town. The Miami FC, the one that plays at Ricardo Silva at uh, FIU in the USL Championship. But, all right. Here we go. Uh, now, you know, you would think... That in the, you know, the when we all get the chance to, to go to bed, you know, that when, we, when we all fall asleep at night, because of how the world works, there might be one night, especially as you're heading into a holiday weekend and uh, traffic tomorrow, uh, Hopefully our friends from Beyond Goals Mentoring can join us for a pre-Christmas message. Uh, we will check on that and see. Uh, otherwise, we're just getting you ready for everything else going on in the world and getting you ready for festive fixtures where your favorite club in England gets to play three times in probably less than seven days. Morning, Badger. Morning, Sam. Morning, yeah. And <laughs> morning, KFC. Yes, we will be getting into the MLS schedule. We will be getting into the, the, uh, the schedule this morning uh, since we didn't get the chance to get into it yesterday but while we were sleeping i feel like sandra bullock should should be now doing the vo it was the return of the super league and i feel like you know dun, 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 i need that drop more than anything else i really do i really need that drop but yes overnight we got this from the European Court of Justice. This is the EU's most senior court. So if you don't believe in the EU, that's probably grounds enough for an appeal. They've ruled that FIFA and UEFA acted unlawfully in blocking the creation of the Super League. Twelve clubs announced, and for those that might have blocked this out of their memory, Twelve clubs, including the Premier League's Big Six, announced the formation of the original Super League in April of 21. But the fan, but the plan collapsed. Once again, this is from our friends at the Telegraph. We're going to be bouncing from Ben Jacobs to the Telegraph and to the Guardian here for the info. Plan collapsed, pressured from UEFA and FIFA, and even from the UK government. The Grand Chamber, <coughs> sorry, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Justice had been asked to decide whether UEFA and FIFA acted against competition law by blocking the formation of the Super League back in 21, then seeking to sanction the clubs involved. The court ruled UEFA and FIFA rules granting prior approval for new competitions are contrary to EU law. A release issued by the court said such rules were, quote, contrary to competition law and the freedom to provide services, end quote. The court release added, quote, there is no framework for the FIFA and UEFA rules ensuring that they are transparent, objective, non-discriminatory, and proportionate. Similarly, the rules giving FIFA and UEFA exclusive control over the commercial exploitation of the rights related to those competitions are such as to restrict competition given their importance for the media, consumers, and television viewers in the EU. The court observes that the organization of interclub football competitions and the exploitation of the media rights are quite evidently economic activities. They must therefore comply with the competition rules and respect the freedoms of movement, even though the economic pursuit of sport has certain specific characteristics, such as the existence of associations having certain regulatory and control powers and the power to impose sanctions, the court also observes that in parallel with those powers, FIFA and UEFA themselves organize football competition. 
So now we wonder and we go forward. Bernd Reichart, chief executive of Super League Promoters A22, jumped on the 280-character app 12 minutes later. We have won the right to compete. The UEFA monopoly is over. Football is free. Clubs are now free from the threat of sanction and free to determine their own futures. A release issued by the court added, once again, the court observes that the organization of interclub football competitions and the media rights thing we talked about. So, Bernd Reichardt wasted no time in jumping on the social medias. Once again, important to emphasize the judgment is not tantamount to a legal approval of the Super League. It's just a ruling that states that FIFA and UEFA forbidding its creation was in violation of EU law. Once again, that's the key factor here. The court basically said to FIFA and UEFA, bruh, you can't keep them from creating something, no matter how poorly it was executed. Wasn't just saying that, yes, the Super League is supposed to, sorry, the Super League is a thing that should happen. Basically, what the court did is they said, here's the deal. It basically went down the lines of restraint of trade to FIFA and UEFA, saying, you know, you got to let them figure it out themselves. You can't just sit there. You, as two leagues, cannot say, no, you can't do this. But the court didn't say that the Super League in and of itself was approved by the court. It was more along the lines of the idea of creating something. FIFA and UEFA can't sit there and say no because that would fall under restraint of trade. At least that's my my quick interpretation here. So Tom Morgan at the Telegraph, what does this mean? What does this mean? for the clubs in the Premier League. All but certain to reject a revived plan. And once again, this was about a quarter to five this morning, and clubs have come out with statements since. Because why, if you are a a team in the Premier League, why would you jump considering what revenues currently are right now with all of the TV contracts? Positives for UEFA and FIFA. And this is the the folks at the Telegraph did a deep dive in all of this. Paragraph 144 said it was accepted that there is legitimacy in protecting sporting merit. Quote, those various specific characteristics support a finding that it is legitimate to subject the organization and conduct of international professional football competition to common rules intended to guarantee the homogeneity. Man, these are just big words early in the morning and coordination of these competitions within within an overall match calendar as well as more broadly to promote in a suitable and effective manner the holding of sport competitions based on equal opportunities and merit. It's also legitimate to ensure compliance with those common rules through rules put in place by FIFA and UEFA on prior approval of the competitions and participation of the clubs and players therein. So then UEFA comes out with a response. Five o'clock this morning, our time. Quote, UEFA says it takes note of the judgment delivered today by the ECJ in the European Super League case, but they add, quote, the ruling does not signify an endorsement or validation of the so-called Super League. That is true. It rather underscores a historical shortfall within UEFA's pre-authorization framework, a technical aspect that has already been acknowledged and addressed in June of 22. UEFA is confident in the robustness of its new rules and specifically that they can comply with all relevant European laws and regulations. UEFA remains resolute in its commitment to uphold the European football pyramid, ensuring that it continues to serve the broader interests of society. We will continue. I feel like I should put my hand over my heart and my other hand in the air. We will continue or pound on a pound on a, pl- a, a dais or something ensuring that uh, it continues to serve the broader interests of society. We will continue 
to shape the European sports model collectively with national associations. Leagues, clubs, fans, players, coaches, EU institutions, governments, and partners alike. We trust that the solidarity-based European football pyramid that the fans and all stakeholders have declared as their irreplaceable model will be safeguarded against the threat of breakaways by European and national law. La Liga came out with a statement. This is kind of like yesterday with U.S. soccer. Everybody's got to have a statement. La Liga highlights that the ruling of the Court of Justice of the European Union does not endorse a Super League and that UEFA already adopted in 22 a modification of its regulations for the authorization of new competitions. Although the promoters of the Super League claim that this ruling proves them right, the reality is that the CJEU has been clear in stating that, quote, a competition like that of the Super League project should not necessarily be authorized, end quote. Having been asked general questions about the rules of FIFA and UEFA, the Court of Justice does not rule in its ruling on this specific project. And then, of course, the British government decides to get involved. Yes, conceptually alive, Kefsi, in name. In, in name only right now. We don't know folks who are, who are jumping ship from their leagues and heading there that way. Shooter, the Super League is good, and a lot of these leagues are boring as hell. German and French leagues snore. Government sources by Tom Morgan Telegraph. Government sources involved the introduction of a regulator for the domestic game ruled out any future English involvement. Uh, insiders claim the new football governance bill will stop licensed clubs from joining breakaway competition. So Britain has stuff on the books. ESL came out with a statement at uh, 6 o'clock this morning. Barcelona came out with a statement. I feel like I'm going to say insert group here came out with a statement a lot. Barcelona wishes to express its satisfaction with the sentence of the court, Justice of the European Union, assessing the Super League project as proposed by A22 Sports. As one of the clubs driving the Super League project, FC Barcelona feels that the sentence paves the way for a new elite-level football competition in Europe by opposing the monopoly. Once again, I feel I should have my hand in my heart and my other hand in the air. FC Barcelona feels that the sentence paves the way for the new elite level of football competition in Europe by opposing the monopoly over the football world and wishes to initiate new dis discussions as to the path that European competitions should take in the future. Then Barcelona pats itself on the back for being a pioneering club in the world of sport. The club feels that the medium-term sustainability of European football entails the need create a concept along the lines of the Super League proposed by A22. A system of competition that will address such, such issues as fixture overload and the excessive number of games between national teams that will work toward regulation of financial fair play among participating teams. Aha, okay. Financial fair play among participating teams. Don't care about anybody else. It's like, y'all can do whatever you want. We're going to allegedly have financial fair play here. We're going we're gonna to have FFP amongst the Super League group. Y'all can do whatever the heck you want if you ain't a part of it. And that will put local and international players and supporters at the center. This system must respect the functions and sustainability of domestic competitions and should be a meritocracy that is primarily based on results on the pitch. So, yeah, that means that uh, Mom and Pop Meat Pies FC will not be a part of the Super League. Barca wishes to continue to offer its experience. Thank you, Barca. Barca wishes to continue to offer its experience and knowledge of different sports to propose to propose solutions for current issues in elite sport. You know, y'all, y'all ain't doing it right. So us here at Barcelona. We're going to put our hand over your shoulders. We're going to put our arm around you and tell you that this is the way it needs to be done. It's awfully modest of Barcelona. How, you know, it's fantastic of them to offer their services in this way. That is why it is declaring its support for the Super League, promoted by A22 and encourages constructive debate among both domestic and international football bodies, which have now been endorsed by today's sentence by the CJEU, the foregoing is all subject to a complete reading of the sentence. 
Florentina Perez had a statement. Real Madrid president. Quote, From Real Madrid, we welcome with great satisfaction the decision taken by the CJEU, which is responsible for guaranteeing our principles, values, and freedoms. In the coming days, we will carefully study the scope of this resolution, but I do anticipate two conclusions of great historical significance. Perez continued. First of all, that European club football is not and will never be a monopoly again. No, but it might be an exclusive club if Florentino Perez gets his way. And secondly, that from today, the clubs will be the owners of their destiny. Club C fully recognized our right to propose and promote European competitions that modernize our sport and attract fans from all over the world. We're kind of seeing this in college football, aren't we? In short, today the Europe of freedoms has triumphed again, and today soccer and its fans have also triumphed. Faced with the pressures we've received for more than two years, law, reason, and freedom are imposed today. And for this reason, Real Madrid will continue to work for the sake of football. Just as almost 70 years ago, we took a fundamental step in the history of soccer with the creation of the European Cup. Today, we again have the duty and responsibility to give European football the new impetus it needs so much. And for this, We will continue to defend a modern project fully compatible with national competitions open to all based on sporting merit. So it's not open to all. Open to all if you're good enough. You make the top of your league, you can come in. If your mom and pop meat pies FC, the answer is no. A project that will bring economic sustainability for all clubs. Unless you're not a part of the Super League. That above all will protect the players and excite fans around the world. That is true. We will do it despite the campaigns we've suffered. And that without a doubt will intensify from today. But no one said that ending a monopoly after so many decades was simple. We are facing the great opportunity to improve European club football by having a league of greatest hits. Quote, he continued. Two more paragraphs, I swear. A football at the height of the 21st century with a transparent governance that knows how to live with new technologies that once again provokes the passion and emotion that fans really need. Let me tell have you seen the protests in England? Let me tell the European clubs that we are facing the beginning of a new time in which we can work in freedom from constructive dialogue without threats, without acting against anything or anyone, and with the aim of innovating and modernizing football to continue nurturing the passion of the fans. From today, the present and future of football, European football, are finally in the hands of clubs, players, and their fans. Once again, have you seen the reaction of the fans? Our destiny belongs to us. And we have a great responsibility for us. This day will mark a before and an after. It is a great day for the history of football and for the history of sport, end quote. I feel like I need music under this, and I should have thought about that. You know, like in in the scene in Animal House, where Tim Matheson is in front of the, the court, I put it to you, Greg. I'm going to revoke your charter. I feel like that's the kind of music that we need, you know, like the low hum of of patriotic music or something that is uh, without license. (sighs) Department for Culture, Media, and Sport in England further underlined government plans to introduce powers to stop any breakaway. We note the decision by the ECJ with regard to the European Super League. The attempt to create a breakaway competition was a defining moment in English football and was universally condemned by fans, clubs, and government. Apparently, uh, Florentino Perez, uh, his line of sight stopped at the English Channel. We took decisive action at the time by triggering the fan-led review of football governance, which called for the creation of a new independent regulator for English football. We will shortly be bringing forward legislation that makes this a reality. 
and will stop clubs from joining any similar breakaway competitions in the future. The Breakaway, remember, uh, commissioned the fan-led review of football, which recommended the creation of that regulator. Raphael Honigstein. German clubs will not join a new Super League for socio-political reasons. English clubs are not going to join for legal and economic. Non-starter in England and Germany. Back in February, remember, it relaunched under a new guise. New plans called for a multi-division format featuring in the region of 80 teams all of which guaranteed at least 14 matches, guided by the following principles. So here's here was what would happen at, what what happened in February after they uh, got called out on the first one. Meritocratic competitions, multi-divisional format, no permanent members. Clubs remain committed to domestic tournaments, improve competitiveness with stable, sustainable resources, player health at the center of the game, well-enforced and transparent financial sustainability rules, create the world's best football competition, improved fan experience, develop and finance women's football by putting it center stage side-by-side side with the men, significant increase in solidarity and respect for EU laws and values. Maybe if you'd started this way instead of the way that you did, might be a little better. The European Club Association came out with a statement a little before 6 this morning. But the bottom line is, the judgment in no way whatsoever supports or endorses any Super League project. League structure built on a true pan-European pyramid. Say that 10 times fast. 64 participating clubs in three tiers. Star League, Gold League, 16 clubs each. Blue League, the third tier, 32. Annual promotion and relegation between leagues. Promotion into the third tier blue league based on domestic league performance. Aye, aye, aye. A22's presentation of a new proposal has just started. Bernd Reichardt once again came up and said football is free. Today's ruling paves the way for a more exciting competition at a European level within the existing framework. Independent sports lawyers underlined the nuanced nature of the ruling, insisting it was not a slam-dunk victory for the Rebel League. Katarina Pietlovich, General Secretary of the Union of European Clubs, on the balance, I'd say it's definitely more of a victory than a loss for UEFA. Stephen Taylor Heath, which is a true lawyer name if ever there was one, decision based mainly on European competition law. In essence, it says the rules in place in 21, which block the establishment of the competition, are anti-competitive. Ruling has ramifications for other sports, such as the current situation in golf, with live PGA and the European Tour, and perhaps boxing. So then A22 comes out with their new format, and it's a Venn diagram. A22 proposes to create the leading direct-to-fan sports streaming platform in the world called Unify. Digital platform will democratize access to live football, connect fans with their clubs at a scale never before achieved. In addition to live matches, offering highlights, match insights, analysis, club-specific content, and many other interactive options. Isn't that what Apple's doing for Major League Soccer? All women's league matches also distributed on the platform. Women's game center stage. Once again, that's what they are. That's what they have been plotting as a part of all of this. Generating income, the streaming platform from premium subscriptions, distribution partnerships, interactive services, and sponsors. Distribution partnerships will be an important component of the Unify experience to ensure ease of access of fans. Reichardt is pressed in his press conference to name clubs. He did not name any. He did offer something of an olive branch to UEFA. Kevin Miles, chief exec of the Football Supporters Association, he had a statement. 
There is no place for an ill-conceived breakaway super super league. Sorry, super league. Supporters, players, and clubs, and I think that this ends up uh, early quote of the day. Supporters, players, and clubs have already made clear they don't want a stitched-up competition. We all want to see the trigger pulled on the walking dead monstrosity that is the European Zombie League. The European Zombie League. I think that's early. Uh, that that's the early contender for quote of the day. While the corpse might continue to twitch in the European courts, no English side will be joining. The incoming independent regulator will block any club from competing in domestic competition if they join a breakaway Super League. Super League. Success must be earned on the pitch, not stitched up in a boardroom. DFL came out with a statement, German Football Federation explicitly supports the European sports model and rejects competitions outside of those organized by the associations and leagues. Once we've been able to assess the full verdict, we'll comment in more detail. Reichardt continued in his press conference that went a very long time. Solidarity, openness, and meritocracy are the cornerstones of our proposal. Unless you don't make it in from the level of competition, from the, from the uh, promotion relegation part. FIFA came out with a statement. I know that shocks. FIFA has taken note of the ruling issued today by the CJEU in relation to the European Super League Community SL. FIFA will now analyze the decision in coordination with UEFA, the other confederations, and the member associations before commenting further. In line with its statutes, FIFA firmly believes in the specific nature of sport. I lost my place. Ah, including the pyramid structure, which is underpinned by sporting merit and the principles of competitive balance and financial solidarity. Football owes its long and successful history to the above mentioned principles, which FIFA, the confederations and the member associations will continue to promote in the future in the interest of all football fans worldwide. So basically FIFA took their finger and wagged. Manchester United issued a statement a little before 8 o'clock this morning. Our position has not changed. We remain fully committed to participation in UEFA competitions and to positive cooperation with UEFA, the Premier League, and fellow clubs through the ECA on the continued development of the European game. So when Morgan and Ducker are involved from from the Telegraph side, now, you know it's going to be big. Paul McGinnis is on, on the side at the Guardian. UEFA found to be abusing a dominant position in the way it applies its rules. Manchester United, Atletico Madrid, Bayern Munich, the first two of whom had been part of the original Super League plan, express, expressed support for UEFA on Thursday, as did the Premier League, Ligue 1, and the German Football League. So. Who's going to compete? Javier Tebas, president of La Liga, staunch critic of the Super League, backed by Real Madrid and Barcelona, accused Bernd Reichardt of behaving as if he had been drinking until 5 in the morning. That might be the best quote of the day so far. On the contrary, he said it points out that he said the ruling had not stated UEFA and FIFA must admit the Super League. On the contrary, Tebas said, it points out that the criteria for admission to competitions must be transparent, objective, and non-discriminatory principles precisely incompatible with the Super League. And we mentioned Florentino Perez. As part of the Premier League Owners Charter agreed to in June of 22, clubs say they would not engage in the creation of new competition formats outside of the Premier League's rules. Thursday's ruling will now be referred back to a Madrid commercial court after the Spanish jurisdiction made the referral back in 2021, which will apply it to the facts of the Super League case. So from all of that, that's where we are. A22 in the Super League sits there, and they're like, 
you know, this is great for us. Everybody else is like, um, bruh, not so fast. What is a league if it only holds Real Madrid and Barcelona? That'll be the question. So that's where we are with the Super League today. A22 won their court case. FIFA and UEFA acted unlawfully by blocking it. But if ain't nobody playing, you know, I mean, think about it. Originally, the league was supposed to have the 12 members. Milan, Arsenal, Atletico Madrid, Barca, Chelsea, Inter Milan, Juve, Liverpool, Manchester City, Manchester United, Real Madrid, and Spurs, who I think had their nose pressed up against the glass, and they basically uh, opened the door to Spurs at the last minute. It's like, yeah, okay, we need a 12th. Come on in. Ten of those 12s uh, left which left you with Barcelona and Real Madrid. Is it a two-team league? Is it really super at that point? Non-binding decision delivered by the Advocate General in the case last December found rules allowing UEFA to have prior approval of new competitions were compatible with EU law. The original proposal, remember, had the closed format 15 founder clubs immune from relegation. But now you've got the two stages the three groups, the competitions. Can you stop a Super League at the moment? No, in name. Court placed an injunction on sanctions UEFA imposed on the nine clubs who joined the Super League but who later withdrew. Remains to be seen whether UEFA will press on with the sanctions and potentially investigate more serious charges against Real Madrid and Barcelona. So it could have ramifications. Juve, Barca, Real Madrid, they wanted to set this thing up. Juve dropped out, which left you with the two. Could the Premier League clubs join again? They asked Kavi Salakal. And if you don't have any clubs from the Premier League, And as things right now, the way that the rules have been changed, as we talked about a couple of minutes ago. Page one of the Premier League handbook says this. We are collectively committed to the Premier League and recognize our responsibility to support it. I feel like you need to have your hand. It's almost like the Pledge of Allegiance. We're collectively committed to the Premier League and recognize our responsibility to support it. Support it. Support it. We will not engage in the creation of new competitive formats outside of the Premier League's rules, end quote. So will anything happen with English clubs? And which English club would jet? Bayern Munich said no. Doesn't change the attitude. Such a competition would be an attack on the importance of the National Leagues as well as the statics of European football. Atleti. They had like a PowerPoint presentation. Resolution regarding the framework refers to outdated UEFA statutes already amended. Established a partnership that renders the consideration of UEFA as a monopoly meaningless. Through agreements within the joint venture of the ECA and the UEFA. Clubs decide 50% on the sale of sponsorships and TV rights, revenue distribution, and competition formats. European football community does not support the European Super League. Germany, France, England, Italy, Spain, except for Real Madrid and Barcelona, etc. That was in the statement from Atletico Madrid. Oppose the Super League. We advocate for protecting the broader European football family, preserving domestic leagues, and securing qualification for European competitions through on-field performance each season. So there you go. So A22, so at the end of the day, A22 is excited because they feel that this ruling 
by the, the ECJ, European Court of Justice, validates their existence. And that may very well, in fact, be true. It's like, you know, y'all can hang out. But the key here is trying to figure out. <laughs> I may, I may take some out and do here in a second. But just because the court says it's okay for you to exist doesn't mean that folks are going to come and hang out at your party. I mean, you could have you could have the best spread on Christmas Eve, which is Sunday, by the way. You could have the best spread in the world. But if nobody, but it, but if your the rules inside your homeowners association say that you can't go to that party, or you're going to come up to some, you know, some kind of angry thing in your homeowners association at the next meeting, then you're not going to go. Shiny house, top of the hill, biggest house, big side of town. If you can't go to that party because you're going to anger your homeowners association, then you're not going to go to that party. And who's going to go to that party? How many different homeowners associations are going to be mad? All of them. Manchester City's position on the Super League remains the same. No new statement expected. Sources point back to the original withdrawal one back in 2021. Looks like Andrea Agnelli actually uh, also was listening in on the UEFA press conference. He was there. So A22 is happy. UEFA, FIFA, they get it. But how many folks legitimately are going to be a part of this? Not many. Well, it, for card, I know. But the thing is, do you, do you risk do you risk angering your HOA and getting kicked out and trying to find a new home? And the only way that that happens is if you're financially stable enough for that to happen. You're happy with you're happy with uh, you're happy with your paycheck. So that's uh I guess that's the biggest thing here. When you're staring at uh What's going on with the A22? A22, happy to be alive. Courts basically kind of threaded the needle and said, yeah, what UEFA and FIFA did wasn't cool. A22 should exist, or the Super League should exist. But, you know, you know it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean what you think it means. Of course, if you're A22 and burnt Reichardt, it believes what you think it means. Everybody else, not so much. So, if you're a league without clubs, are you really a league? Who jumps? What 64 teams jump? What what 16 marquee clubs, actually 14 because we know two of them, Barca and Real Madrid. What 14 clubs jump to be in that premier group? What 16 want to jump and be a part of the B group? What 32 want to jump and be a part of the C? Here's what you look out for. Teams that are in trouble with FFP, and they know they're about to get bit on the hand, and they're willing to take that jump and go sideways. The financially troubled teams that think that they need to get that financial exclusivity those are the ones that might kick the tires on it so what 14 in the a tier 16 in the b tier and 32 in the c tier would be the ones to jump that's the question going forward nigga moreno hopefully joining us in 40 minutes now kfc i mean Kefsi says, I'm probably alone on this, but I care more about improving the Open Cup than whatever they're doing over there. No, I mean, you're, you have a domestic interest. You know, if you're, if you're interested more about things 
in your own backyard, in your own HOA, than looking over at the other subdivision with all the, you know, with the, the guy that wants to big. So, no, I, I completely get that. It's where it's, you know, it's where you hang your hat. So that, that's, uh, that's where it is. Uh, Tony, we do not take phone calls. So that's what the Twitch pitch is for. You are in the Twitch pitch. So go ahead and let everybody know what your thoughts are here in the Twitch pitch. And that's, that's where the conversation and engagement goes. Uh, I will say this about five years ago. Welcome to season seven, by the way. Five years ago, we did take phone calls. And then for those who are our are, are A-listers, they might remember me when I was running the board and Rusty, who is a legendary caller here at SDH. He called in once, called in twice. Absolutely true, Kefsi. That is absolutely true. Office HD has landlines. That is still true. We still get phone calls especially from uh, family members who haven't quite navigated the whole idea of, of cell phones. But, yeah, Rusty called once. He called twice. He called three times before I realized it was a work. And after that, any phone call that we are not taking, we call it a Rusty. And any conversation that we have like that, you know, that's why we don't take phone calls anymore. That's why we kind of created the Twitch pitch as a part of the conversation that we have on a daily basis, regardless of topic. So that's what's there. But uh, so that was the Super League. Welcome back. Super League. Welcome back. In whatever form you plan on taking, A22 is happy. FIFA and UEFA are like, yeah, darn, we lost the court case. Okay, go for it and see what happens. Hey, did you know that the MLS schedules came out yesterday? Atlanta United's schedule came out. And, uh, you know, some of the highlights in, in the uh, in the schedules, Atlanta United, and, and I will say this, I will say this, February 21st to October 19th. And so, of course, uh, and so, of course, everybody's like, uh, all right, so the regular season schedule, go to MLSsoccer.com and you have all the stories about the uh, the schedule. As you do, Lionel Messi's on the cover of the banner that talks about the regular season schedule. Then you go down to Section 2. Enter Miami 2024 schedule. Which MLS cities will Lionel Messi visit? No real surprise. Other news yesterday, LAFC signed Steve Chirondolo to a contract extension. But let's get into the schedule. Your favorite schedule for your favorite teams. For Atlanta United specifically, they start off February 24th in Columbus against Columbus Crew. So that's how their February schedule starts, at Columbus. Everything's fairly normal in March. Three of your first, well, after the after the game at Lower.com, three of four at home to start in March. You can make some hay. It's New England, Orlando, Chicago. And then you go to BMO to take on Toronto. So you should be able to make some hay in, in March. April. You go to City Field. You get Philly and Cincinnati at home to start your season. Early in the year, then you go to Chicago. Minnesota visits, D.C. visits, May. Then you go to Cincinnati and Nashville. And that's on a quick turn. That's pretty dangerous. Three matches in a week in May. Home to D.C. at Cincinnati in the midweek. At Nashville on the weekend. Then you have LAFC come to town. And then Miami in the midweek, as Ricky points out. Miami in the midweek. Atlanta, Miami both ways on a Wednesday night is stupid. 7.30 on a, on a midweek. 
Intermessy FC comes to Atlanta. Or sorry, no, we start off at Dry Pink in May. Sorry, my bad. You start you start at Dry Pink in May in the middle of the week. Then the one later in the year is uh, is in midweek too. Then you got once, but it's three out of four at home though. May into June, LAFC. You go to Miami. You have Charlotte come to visit. You have Houston come to visit. Go to DC, and then in the midweek again, or on the weekend, midweek is DC. Weekend. You go to St. Louis. We've talked about St. Louis, and it's finally on the calendar. We didn't get it first year. We get it second year. Road trip to to, uh, to St. Louis to take on all caps. I can probably tell you right now I'm going. I mean, birthday birthday is that Monday, so I might end up doing the show from St. Louis on that Monday. But going to St. Louis in City Park, June 22nd. Lock that one in. July's the road trip, three matches in 10 days. New England RSL in Montreal. Then you come back and wrap up the month before uh, the Copa. Home games against NYC and Columbus. You get that month off in the middle. You get that month off in July and August. Come back August 24th. You're on the road at L.A., on the road at Charlotte. Another window, August, September. Two home matches, Nashville and Miami. Three matches in a week, two of them at home. Nashville, Miami, full house probably. And then at Red Bulls on September 21st. Then at least you get a week before you have to go to Philly. October's regular season, you finish up with two of three at home. But once again, it's on a quick turn. Philly, and this is your bridge from September to October. At Philly, quick turn to take on Montreal at home, then quicker turn to take on Red Bulls. Then you wrap up your season two weeks later, you get your bye. On the 12th of October, you get a week to figure things out before you have to go to Orlando Decision Day, 6 o'clock kick in the Eastern Conference on the 19th of October. So, yeah, so Tom, Tom is already, yeah, no messy here in midweek. Got it. September 18th, 730, midweek. So we'll see. So that's the Atlanta United schedule. Uh, Wiley's going to try to go to St. Louis. Lived there for 15 years. Lived there for 15 years. And once again, I, I will, uh, I, you know, I will look at things, you know, uh, I I wish that Austin could have been on the calendar, really wish wish that Austin could have been on the calendar because we get to miss out again on going to Q2. So that's the early part of the, uh, the schedule there. When it comes to the must sees according to the the league 10 must watch games in 2024 inter miami and rsl in match day 1 earliest opening day in mls history at drvp and k wednesday night february 21st so lionel messi's return of course lafc in seattle match day 1 at BMO in Los Angeles, February 24. Toronto and Charlotte. Why is this must see? Why is Toronto and Charlotte? And this, like I said, this is from the league. This is what the league has, has put forth. Toronto and Charlotte is must see. Seriously? Toronto and Charlotte must see? Why? Why? Okay, so here, here's what here's what here's what uh, here's what they say on the website before I get a migraine. This is TFC's home opener, a key milestone at the dawn of John Herd of the John Herdman era as the charismatic former Canadian national team boss makes his first foray into club management, and he's got work to do. Of course, the grand assumption is that Insigne and Bernadeschi will be there. 
Charlotte will be eager to show their progress in year three as their new head coach, Dean Smith, aims to stamp influence on the Carolina club. Match day three, Toronto and Charlotte is must-see. No, that, that does not apply. Sporting in all caps. This one's always fun because it's a rivalry. The Was it the I-59 World Series that we had, Cardinals and Royals? Match day nine at Children's Mercy. I get that one. Okay, cool. The uh, Florida Turnpike uh, Derby, match day 13, Orlando, and uh, Messi and friends at uh, in, in Central Florida. I get it. Okay, cool. Crew and Revs, match day 16, after Memorial Day. Oh, okay, because of Caleb Porter going up against his old club. I-70. Thank you, Wiley. I forget. I, I, I knew it was an interstate. I couldn't remember which one. Uh, Columbus and New England. Only because it's the Caleb Porter Bowl. Nope. Not interested in that one. That is not must-see for me. Can't can't do that. Nope. 7.30 Wednesday night, May 29th at the Death Star. Nope. Just because it's Caleb Porter. and Unless, unless Caleb Porter and the Rebs win and he goes to the crew fans and he shushes them, but that's after the game has been played. That's got nothing to do with the game itself. And truly, it is dependent upon result. That is dependent upon result, period. End of story. So does that make it a must-watch game? No, it makes it a must-watch ending depending on the game. That's it. So this does not qualify. El Trafico, of course, it qualifies. It could get wacky on the junk. It's at the Rose Bowl July 4th, as it should be. Match day 23. Last year, 82,110 showed up at the Rose Bowl. That'd be about par. So I would say sure. Rose Bowl, El Trafico, you bet. That one qualifies. Hell is real. The first installment of Hell is Real, I could stipulate to that. Saturday, September 14th. Did we tell match day 31 for the first installment of Hell is Real? Who are the schedule makers here? Saturday at 7.30, September 14th, TQL. Hell is Real in Cincinnati. Okay, that's fine. I get that one. Atlanta United and Nashville match day 31. Same day at Mercedes Benz. As Ohio's MLS clubs battle for a fight for bragging rights, it's Atlanta and Nashville. Okay, cool. Seattle and Portland. Cascadia, October 19th, match day 37. Okay, cool. But now there's there are some in this list that were put in here. No. Crew New England, no. Not at all. Toronto and Charlotte, no. No. So uh, eight of the ten that uh, the writers at uh, MLSsoccer.com put up there, sure. Two, no. Absolutely not. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Rich, can it lady United stops? Atlanta United didn't schedule. Rich, it's the league. Yell at the league. Uh, turn to your northeast and yell at the league office. Atlanta United can, can Atlanta United stop scheduling the union's visit to Atlanta on a Sunday every time. I'd like to visit the Chick Fil A in Peachtree at in Peachtree City at some point. Well, here's what you do. What you do, Rich, is you schedule your flight home. On or you, well, here's what you do: you do one of two things. You either fly in on a Saturday or fly out on a Monday. And I know that a lot of us have, have here in the South have just adjusted to the fact that Chick Fil A will never open on a Sunday. So, Rich, what you do is you fly in on a Saturday. You get to experience Chick Fil A for like dinner. You got your game, and then you can fly home Monday morning, or you know, come in on Sunday. 
and then have your breakfast and go forward. Work that way. Fly in early or leave late. Ricky, uh, Ricky Ricardo with some news. Once again, the, the intrepid searcher of the 280 character app that, that you are. And we thank you for it because you're faster on it than I am when it comes to uh, what we're staring at. So we'll go ahead and do this. It's two's breaking news, but we'll hit it. Atlanta United, too, has made some signings for MLS Next Pro for the season. Midfielder Jacob Williams, who spent last season with Crown Legacy, is a part of it. Noble Akello, who you may remember from TFC2, Toronto FC2, and the Revs, and Revs2. Noble Akello is in next year. And then, as a part of the keeper crew, John Burner, who was with Jack Collison at Hunt City last season. St. Louis, Missouri. So three signings for Atlanta United 2 and MLS Next Pro. Jacob Williams in the midfield, Noble Akello in the midfield, and John Burner between the sticks to help out the young keepers with Atlanta United 2. So stuff from uh, Steve Cook in the twos this morning. So there's your, there's your, your breaking news there. Uh, Nix is thinking about St. Louis and Nashville in 24. May still put in for uh, Miami, even though it's midweek. Uh, hey, I'm right there with you, brother. I mean, if you can plot your and see, and this is this is uh, this is part of the deal here. If you can, if you can figure out leave budget those kinds of things, then then you've got it made. You can sit there. It's like, yeah, okay, I'll take that midweek. But once again, you've got to navigate your midweeks and your vacation time and your leave and all those kinds of things. So, uh, but so that's what you're that's what you're staring at. So, completely understand the idea of wanting to leave on a uh, uh, on a midweek, but uh, definitely locked into other places. Shooter, going back to hour number one. Shooter needs a new league to watch. Apparently, he's done with Major League Soccer. So, do I even need to ask Shooter what you think about Caleb Porter as the new head coach of the New England Revolution? Uh, Tom, talking about traffic, which tomorrow will be insane. Not taking any chances. Learn making the regular trek to Charleston. Need to leave early Friday on the road by 6.30 in the a.m. So, you'll be listening to the, the show as you're, you're heading into Chucktown. So, uh, you'll be, yeah, you'll be, ooh, what, uh, depending on how you go, you'll either be in Augusta. If you go Augusta, Columbia and down, or if you go towards Savannah, you'll be, uh, Statesboro ish working your way over. Uh, <laughs> Ricky. Yeah. In our discussion about this, the super league broke bars are going to give solutions. Absolutely true. They're telling everybody else what to do. Yeah. You, you need to help. You need to help out. But we're all here to make money, uh, unle- unless we don't like you. Barcelona, Real Madrid. And Ricky, that's absolutely true. Solve your financial issues first, and he told Florentino <laughs> Perez, shut up. About right. Uh, yeah, and Sam, isn't Champions League already a Super League? Yes, it is. It is. It's the best of the best. And you can qualify in every single time. You do well domestically. You qualify into uh, you qualify into the Champions League. That's that's why they call it the Champions League. <laughs> Badger, yeah, I would sing it, but I don't have the I don't have the the chops to sing it. Uh, yeah, and, and we want to complain about Open Cup and Leagues Cup. Uh, yes, they've learned and come back. Four card ESL is the future. Get on board or be left behind. Future is coming. ESL equals future. Viva la revolution. Revolution televised for free to everyone until it's not. Uh, My guess is if this was to fly, if you found 64 folks, if you found 16 or 14, 
14 plus 16 plus 32 in that promotion relegation division, that, that third division of folks. I'd love to know how the money is supposed to be uh, split up with the original 64. Obviously, for those of you in that top 16, you're going to be making a lot more money than those in the second 16 and then especially those in the third league in the 32. Just saying. I'm just saying. Four card wants to know if MLS next pro teams will be allowed in the ESL. I need a rim shot. I really do. I really do. Because Kepsi's looking forward to Rocket, Rita, Rita, and Xavi. Absolutely. Yep, Badgermon, you would get El Clasico every week. Until you get 14 more clubs, you get El Clasico every blanking week. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So that's what you're staring at. Rich, stupid MLS scheduled for the Union. Austin away. Portland away. Back to back. Okay, all right. So here's a, here's a question. Rich is Rich. Rich seems to have a a uh, a thought pattern here, and he's trying to figure it out. All right. So MLS for Philly, Austin away. At least you get Austin this year. Atlanta United doesn't. And Portland away back to back. Have to choose. You might choose Portland. So question to the floor: Does Rich go to Austin or does Rich go to Portland? I would go to Austin. Like I said, for for the boss and I, when we go to Austin, we stay downtown and take Uber out to wherever. But double check the date of the Austin game. If it's during college football season, make sure that it's during an away game because you will not be able to get a hotel unless you're out by the airport, maybe. And you're going from one end of Austin to the other. You're going from one end to the you're, – you're taking Ubers. Double check the date on the Austin game because if it's during college football season, getting a hotel will be a bear. Double check that before you make your decision. Four card, absolutely true. Bars is here for the loyalty check. Okay, it's March. All right, then you'll be fine. But I would suggest, uh, you know, because it's an experience. I mean, it's it's great. You go downtown. Like I said, the boss and I, we go downtown. We go to all the arts that are there. I mean, when we were there last time, just to give you an example, had barbecue that was ridiculous in a good way. Had Tex-Mex that was ridiculous in a good way. And then we went to go see Paddy Lapone at the Art Center. That's what our weekend was last time we went to Austin, Texas. That's how, you know, off kilter the ideas are. I mean, literally, when we had tickets to the Patty Lapone concert, we had barbecue first across the street from the art center. And we walked the barbecue off to go into the art center. The barbecue was ridiculous. But then, I mean, just the, the, the juxtaposition of having barbecue and then going to go see Patty Lapone. That, that's what we were staring at. Knicks. Early July is a hell of a road nightmare for Atlanta. Yeah, it is. New England to Salt Lake, back to Montreal, back to back to back. You are not kidding. And that's one that you've got to manage. There, there are some, there are some three in a week that you've got to manage. You've really got to, you've really got to manage some stuff here. That stretch in May, a three in a week. You start with DC, then you go to Cincinnati in the midweek, and then you go to Nashville. Three in a week, two of them at Cincinnati, at Nashville on the quick turn. That one's a tough one. And you mentioned early July. But New England and Salt Lake, that's the 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 one to look at. You start at home. I'll go back another match. You start the 29th against Toronto at home. Then you go to New England. Then you go to RSL. I don't think the team is coming back. They're going to stay on the road. After that game in New England, they're probably flying to Salt Lake. July 4th, happy you know, happy birthday, America. We're flying to, to Salt Lake City. Yeah, you ain't you ain't coming home. Then at least you've got a week after the RSL game, you're probably coming home after that match is over. 
get a couple days in your own bed before you go to Montreal. But then, once again, you have five matches in 18 days. July is ridiculous. Five matches in 18 days. And Rich, sidebar, if you can get into South by Southwest the same weekend that Philly's playing Austin, that might be another hotel adventure as well. Double check it, start now. But yeah, Nick's to your point, July on the whole is a bear for Atlanta United. July 3rd, and legitimately it's six matches in 24 days. July 29th at home against uh, Toronto. Midweek, Boston. Gillette, Foxborough, flying to Providence. Weekend, flying from New England to RSL. Then at least you get a week to get you ready for the road trip to Montreal. And then you finish before the month break at the end of July. Well, at least you finish in your own bed, NYC and Columbus. But six matches in 24 days to get you to July and August and the Copa. Home to Toronto, at New England in the midweek, flying directly to RSL for the weekend. You get a week, then you fly to Montreal probably on that Friday, so you get four days of practice in. You fly to Montreal, you come back home, you've got NYC on the midweek, you've got Columbus on the weekend, then you've got the Copa. And you get some international breaks and, and some cup breaks and things like that in, in August and September and October. But yeah, that stretch, end of June through July to the Copa, you might want to try to bank some points early because you know that there's going to be some roster rotation in June and July. So 6-24 and 24 for Atlanta United. That's the stretch to look at heading into the Copa. Other news, gossip, rumor, and innuendo, stuff left unsaid. <laughs> we spent most of our time this morning talking about the Super League and its legal return. The legal return. Tom Lockyer out of the hospital, recovering at home. Fantastic news. Have it. Remember, he had cardiac arrest, Luton and Bournemouth. That game has been, uh, it's going to be played from the beginning. But Tom Lockyer recovering at home. Fantastic news for the captain of Luton Town. Love that. Festive fixtures, by the way, begin today. Crystal Palace and Brighton. Joel Ward out, injured, Veltman out. Roberto Deserbi on rotation. He says he doesn't love the heavy rotation he's used with his starting 11s, but believes his players are adapting well. Gossip rumor and innuendo before we get into Nico, hopefully at, uh, at 10.30, and the rejoin of uh, Thursdays with Nico, where we get to talk schedules and, and things, coaching carousel. Real Madrid could be interested in re-signing Rafael Varane after David Alaba's injury. Eric Ten Hag wants to keep Varane and Casemiro in the January window. Arsenal are leading Chelsea in the race to sign Ivan Toney from Brentford. Brentford continues to make the point that you're going to have to pay a fair amount. High eight, if not nine. To the left of the decimal point. Manchester United are interested in Real Sociedad winger uh, Takafusa Kubo as a potential replacement for Anthony. Kubo has scored six and has three assists, so nine goal actions so far this year with Real Sociedad. That's from the three-letter paper. Take the information at your own peril. Bayer Leverkusen and RB Leipzig Stuttgart exploring a deal to sign Jaden Sancho from 90 Minutes. Juve could hold a slight advantage over Newcastle in their attempts to sign Manchester City midfielder Calvin Phillips as the 28-year-old wants to know about the playing time he'd get before deciding which club to join with potentially more opportunity in Italy. Brentford, Brighton, Forest. 
interested in Hoffenheim's forward Maximilian Bayer. Liverpool and Leverkusen also watching. Chelsea not interested in signing Aaron Ramsdale in January. Linked with a move away after making just five Premier League starts this season. That comes from Fabrizio Romano. Ramsdale will not allowed to leave will not be allowed to leave Arsenal in January despite his lack of playing time, according to Football Insider. Everton have placed a 100 million pound price tag on Jared Branthwaite. The mid interest from United and Spurs. Fulminense's midfielder Andres reiterated his desire to play in the Premier League amid interest from Fulham. Spurs have a long-standing interest in English defender Tosin Adara Bioyo and could make a move for him in January. Fulham hope, though, that the uh, 26-year-old extends his contract with them beyond next summer. Spurs have opened talks to sign Nice defender Jean-Claire Todibo in January with Manchester United also linked. The standard is letting us know uh, what we have been talking about for a very long time. That Steve Cooper is in line to replace Roy Hodgson when he leaves Crystal Palace. So Steve Cooper can sit and get a paycheck from Evangelinus Maranakis for a while. Another couple of uh, stories. Chelsea, Liverpool interested in signing uh, Inter Milan midfielder Nicola Barella. Liverpool yet to find a replacement for Jörg Schmetke, their sporting director with the German set to lead the club at the end of the season, having only joined in May. So Liverpool looking for a new sporting director. Nuno was appointed as Nottingham Forest boss on a two-and-a-half-year deal. He says he stayed up until 4 o'clock in the morning trying to figure out how to fix Nottingham Forest. Good luck on that. Donny van de Beek is undergoing a Frankfurt medical. Manchester United still continuing to monitor Serho Girassi as Stuttgart won in the Bundesliga 3-0 over Augsburg. Another couple of stories really quickly. Uh, you know, we mentioned uh, van de Beek. Proposed loan move to Eintracht Frankfurt, edging closer to completion, according to Fabrizio Romano. Buy option clause isn't mandatory, but it would cost 11 million euro fixed, plus another four in add-ons. It gives the here we go. So uh, keep an eye on Van de Beek and uh, Eintracht Frankfurt going forward. Also, it is, uh, we mentioned RB Leipzig and Jaden Sancho. Yeah, Nuno on a two and a half year deal. I don't think he lasts that long. I legitimately do not think that Nuno Espirito Santo, unless he changes the way that he plays, philosophically, he ain't going to last that long because we all know about how, uh, we all know about the, the level of patience that Evangelinus Maranakis has. And it ain't much. It ain't much. Three transfer windows since Forrest returned to the Premier League. The club has spent more than £280 million on 44 new players. 44. 44 freaking players. Legitimately, how do you think... How do you legitimately think that you're going to have any kind of continuity or calm if you invest forty in, in 44 new players. 44 freaking new players. Just saying. Some domestic news, a couple of pieces. Uh, if you missed it, we had a great conversation with Bev Yanez, the new head coach at uh, Racing Louisville. Racing Louisville got a six-figure transfer fee for Tembi Gatlana as she heads to Tigres. Second highest in NWSL history for an NWSL player leaving for a foreign club. Lauren Donaldson named the head coach of Chicago Red Stars, coaching his native Jamaica on their historic run in the 2023 World Cup. North Carolina FC signed four U18 players for 2024. 
17-year-old forward uh, Julian Plasius signed from LAG's Academy, led to the 2023 MLS Next Cup U17 title. They also signed Nick Holiday, Kyron Lumsden, and Adrian Palayo. They're all moving to the USL Championship. We mentioned the, uh, we mentioned the uh, multi-extension for Steve Chirundolo, and I didn't know if you saw this. Did not know if you saw this. It's from uh, Mike Wojtal and our friends at Soccer America Daily. Sheriff's FC, a cost-free club funded by Alameda County Sheriff's nonprofit Deputy Sheriff's Activities League, the DSAL, learned this week that the DSAL board voted to cut its competitive soccer program. Next, we'll catch up with that in just a sec. I'll loop back. Located south of Oakland, this is from Mike Wojtala. Serving an unincorporated area including Ashland, Cherryland, and San Lorenzo, population of over 60,000. Sheriffs fields 18 boys and girls clubs, 225 players in MLS Next, U13 and 14, and NorCal Premier 13 through 17. Interview with from the KTV UTV DSAL Executive Director Patrick Eisner. Incredibly expensive to run on average. Our annual cost for the program is about $650,000 a year. Added the board's extremely hard decision came down to ending the competitive soccer program or making cuts to recreational soccer and other programs such as dance and jujitsu. Quote, it's really hard to justify when we could use that same amount of funding and apply it across to three or 4,000 kids rather than a segment of 200 to 250. DSAL's director of soccer, Glenn Van Stratum, players and parents gathered Tuesday night at the Alameda County Sheriff's Department to plea for funding, at least through the 23-24 season ending in June. Van Stratum said this is one of the last free-to-play programs that exists in Northern California. We're only asking for six months so that the kids can finish what they started. KTVU, the Fox affiliate in San Francisco, reported DSAL has been able to acquire additional funding to make up for grant money that's run out. Parents have created an Instagram page at Save Sheriffs FC with the uh, goal of raising the estimated 200 grand needed to fund the program through the end of the season. March of 2020, at Sheriffs FC was accepted to join the USDA. And when the DA ceased operations a month later, Sheriffs entered U13 and 14 in September of 2020. 20. Jared Smith joining us. Morning, Jared. Good morning, John. Oh boy. What happened we, now? We've been talking oh. a lot. We've been talking a lot about the Super League. Oh, the Super oh, pray tell what happened. It's, I'm sorry. I've been out of I've been out of the mix this morning. I've been on calls. Nothing. Everyone wrong. wants to have phone calls since the end of the calendar year. This is a high crime. Yes. Uh a, a ruling came out very, very early this morning from the European Court of Justice, and everybody obviously, much like yesterday, came out with a statement. The, uh, the European Court of Justice ruled FIFA and UEFA acted unlawfully in blocking the creation of the Super League. <laughs> this was never going to die. No, nope, that's, that's not. Yes. Uh, court ruled UEFA and FIFA rules granting prior approval for new competitions are contrary to EU law. And so, of course, A22 that created the Super League is very, very happy. They think that everything is back on, even though they only have Barcelona and Real Madrid as teams. They have come up with a new competition model that has three tiers, uh, two levels, an A level of 16, a B level of 16, a C level of 32. I'd love to know what 64 teams they think they're going to get, considering all the all the the big leagues in and around Europe are basically saying, nope, none of our none of our teams are, are interested in jumping. And so it, it is. It is in uh, in name. The Super League is back. Just after our buddy Bernd Reichert and and A twenty two because he's come out and said we're back, we're back, we're back. We have a new model. Hey, look at us. And, and uh, yeah, so the the Super League has not died. It is still there. Okay, well there you go. Yes. Oh, that's fun. <clears throat> and then the schedule came out yesterday once again because we don't have a uh, an afternoon drive show. We started talking about it this morning. Um. Yeah, the great crime being that there's no Atlanta San Jose game. There should always be an Atlanta San Jose game. Quit trying to make Atlanta and LAFC happen. Um, this is the fetch of MLS. <laughs> Quit trying to make it happen. I'm really tired of it. Also, Atlanta has like four games against the top teams from the West last year. Yay! Mm-hmm. Um, why can't you give us the bottom dwellers all the time? I'll take a year of like 
I'll take a year of really bad scheduling. Like, oh, you're straight. The schedule sucks. Great. Beautiful. Do like Florida did for football in the mid aughts where, or, or, or like Ohio state did where it was like, we played the big 10 games. What else did you do? Uh, we played Youngstown. We played, <laughs> state. We played Akron. We played Miami of Ohio. We played the Bobcats. That was our schedule. Beautiful. Let me put my feet up. Mm-hmm. Um, ugh, man, those San Jose games pissed me off. Although we don't have to play Seattle this year, so that's nice. Yeah. Uh, one way or another, we don't have to deal with Seattle. Seattle doesn't have to deal with us. Everyone can just breathe. Now do the same thing with LAFC. Please, I am begging you. Also, I hate ending decision day at Orlando. Um, um, <clears throat> that's going to be great for the league. Mm-hmm. Um, they get a rivalry uh, to end the season. By all accounts, based on the teams, the way they looked, especially in the second half of the season, after Atlanta put its ducks in a row, uh, you would, and depending, a lot of this is going to depend on how Orlando does with the rest of the offseason, because they do have guys going out. I mean, uh, Pereira, I think, is uh, is already gone. They're going to have, in January, I'm imagining they're going to have teams coming for some of their younger players. We'll see how Orlando rebuilds it because they didn't spend a lot of money and they put together a really good team. Can they replicate mm-hmm. that or do they have to splash the cash? Right. And how are they able to do it? But by all accounts, this should be a really, really fun uh, way to end the uh, end of the regular season. Yep. And we also talked about the uh, six matches in 24 days leading up to the Copa, which mm-hmm. – it is fairly murderous in and of itself. June 29, Toronto at Mercedes-Benz. Yep. Yep. July 3rd in Gillette, flying across the country for the weekend to take on RSL. Yeah, Coming- that's, that's, a, that's dude, I get to have computers that make these schedules nowadays. It's not like a couple in a bathroom in Pittsburgh making it like the old days. Yeah. Um, some of that stuff's unconscionable, man, like. You're, you're, you're writing in scheduled losses, mm-hmm. which in the NBA we accept because you have 82 games. So, but, but like we're, we're, where it can be, you have a, a smaller number of games and they carry more weight in MLS, man. That's really annoying. Yep. I know it's going to happen, but it really pisses me off. Carry on. Yeah. Uh, so then you get at least a, a couple of days to rest before you get to fly to Stad Saputo on the 13th. So three matches in a row in 11 days at New England, at RSL, at Stad Saputo before you wrap up leading into the Copa on a quick turn after the game on the 13th. You've got a midweek against NYC at home, and then you've got a weekend against Columbus at home before the Copa in late July. Six matches in 24 days. If we killed them over 24 days, then maybe they cannot be dead by the time the Copa's done. Yeah. Oh, just kidding. Some of these guys are going to play in the Cobra. Yes. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I know they wanted to, like, oh, we have to address schedule compression. Look, man, a lot of this is, like, a lot of this is, wow, these four wounds keep showing up on the back of my hand, and we need to address this. Okay, well, you're holding a fork in your other hand. Yeah, how did this happen? <laughs> Uh, well, that, that, it's like, oh, our players continue to have the same kinds of muscle injuries and, and despite the, the best efforts of, uh, uh, of our physios, but yeah, six matches in 24 days. And as we were breaking it down, I said, there's no way that they come back here from Gillette. They're going to fly straight to RSL and, and Mike and Jason are basically going to be gone for five to six days. Yeah, they'll be fine. They'll get some food. <laughs> and then whatever, well, you eat, whatever you eat in Salt Lake. Yes, exactly. So, uh, you know, at New England, fly out of Providence, go to RSL, go there, come back here for four days, fly up to Montreal, go to Stad Saputo. Great environment, but it's the fourth match in, in uh, 30 days, as September, April, June, and November. Uh, 14 days. Uh, 15 days. So fourth match in 15 is that flight to Montreal. Then you come home for the quick turn for three matches in a week at Montreal, hosting NYC, hosting Columbus, and you've got the Copa. Stop punching yourself. Stop punching yourself. What are you doing? Stop hurting yourself that way. Uh, yeah, Knicks. We're all trying to figure out who did this. It's 
<laughs> and, and 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 we still and we still have to figure out how open cup is going to break down because that yeah. that conversation is not done and yeah. we'll see what they do. Yeah. Uh, viewing uh, viewing habits for today: be in and be in an Espanol simulcasting Turkish Super League at noon. If you don't have be in, if you don't have a CDO for the fans, Nuestra Tele Gold TV, you can get it at Fanatis FNTZ.co slash soccer down here. You can help out the network. You can help out the show, and you can add to your sicko's viewing habits. Uh, FS2 has the league that we don't talk about or promote at one o'clock. Uh, ESPN Deportes has a doubleheader in La Liga at 1 and 3.30. Real Betis, Girona, Alaves, and Real Madrid. Uh, Deportes is simulcasting the league that we don't talk about or promote at 1 o'clock. Gold TV has the Dutch Cup doubleheader. Hercules and Ajax at 12.45. PSV and FC Twente at 3. 2 to NA has a club friendly with Barca and Club America at 9. Women's Champions League on the zone doubleheader at 12.45. Doubleheader at 3. ESPN Plus has more La Liga for you today. Cadiz, Real Sociedad at 1, Real Betis, and Girona at 1, Mallorca, Osasuna, 320, Alaves, and Real Madrid at 330. Uh, uh, is the Turkish League shut down? I'm sitting here staring at things. Uh, hang on. Turkish Super League. Now you're having me look, Badger. Uh, I was literally just reading the grid off of uh, our friends at Soccer America. Uh, Turkish Super League. Is it shut down still? Is it? Is it? Is it? Uh, I'm seeing nothing about it being shut down, so perhaps it's back up and running. Uh, if you have the information, please, please share with the class. And, uh, so they're through match day 15 and 16, so they're heading to match day 17. So, uh, uh, scores and fixtures, uh, no, there's the, actually, they have Ariza Spore and Pendix Spore and Samson Spore and Kanye Spore. They're playing right now. So they, they are playing right this very second. Anko de Guchu and Hatay Spore and Besiktas and Alanya Spore are playing uh, later today. So uh, they're still they're still up and running, uh, at least according to our friends at the BBC with the schedules. Um, so what else, you know, when you looked at the scheduling and we went through the the two, the top 10 alleged matchups for uh, the league as, pr- as promoted by the league website, one of them they had Charlotte and Toronto. Hey, it's the beginning of John Herdman and the beginning of Dean Smith in four corners. Hey, this is must watch. And I'm like, no, it's not. Uh, it, it's, but it's, it's too, fr- I get it, but it's two franchises that they, that, ever, that they're going to want to be successful. You want Charlotte to be successful because you can prop, you know, 65, 70,000 people in there when it's good. Uh-huh. Um, and then Toronto went from being an absolute disaster class in their early days to having a small little franchise run to being clown fraud. Yes. This is two stories where if you want to, if you want to hit your wagons to narratives are us, these are two mm-hmm. you can follow up. Well, one team trying to regain the glory that was lost to them. The other team trying to He's making fun of teams and the I'm robots. Putting for the first time. <laughs> you try to be John Facenda. This time a manager won't swear in another language. Exactly. To the national media. Yep. Uh, we are in the last uh, half hour of the show on a Thursday, which means one thing. As, as he adjusts the brim and he's fixing the beard, he's making sure that he's styling and profiling and getting ready for us. That means one thing. We go to the, North, we go to the Pacific Northwest. And bring in our buddy, Nico. Welcome back, my friend. Hey, what's going on, guys? I'm coming remote to you guys. So I'm trying to, like, give myself the best lighting. But it looks like I have some sort of yellow fever here. I don't know really <laughs> sure. Uh, but I'm uh, trying to do my best, guys. Wanted to be on. i uh, just been running around as I prepare myself to take two weeks off from uh, other work things so uh yeah just wanted to come on say hello how's everybody doing all right man it is me and it is Jarrett, and it is you sir as we break things down before christmas how's the christmas shopping by the way are you done yes uh finally done yesterday i got my brother uh bob marley poncho he like wears that type of thing you know like the uh the cloth ponchos you know he wears those type of things so I ended up getting him uh, one of those, and uh, that was the last one. Uh, 
thankfully all that shopping is done. Malls have been crazy, so I'm excited to be done. All right. Uh one of the topics that has come out on the Twitch pitch is the the coaching carousel. And since you haven't been on in two weeks, there have been some folks that have assumed some duties, and there are still some teams that are looking for some coaches. When you look at the folks that are now in the barn, Charlotte's got Dean Smith, New England's got Caleb Porter, and we still have some absences. Let's talk about the, the ones that have been filled. Bruce Arena's still out there, as a matter of fact. So the guys that are now in as the new head coaches in Major League Soccer, what do you think? I thought the Dean Smith one made some sense, at least for a guy that's experienced, that ha has dealt with uh, failing franchi franchises, that he has kind of revamped and, and moved to new uh, levels uh, and really been able to recover – the trajectory of a of a club uh so in that sense it makes sense in theory in the guy you're bringing in what you're hoping he can accomplish but i don't know if he fits the style of players that are in in charlotte um he um kind of talked about the module of, of soccer he wants to implement and i'm not sure if the players that he has currently are going to be able to execute that. We still don't know what's going to happen with uh, Sadersky. Is Capetti going to stay there? Does it feel like Capetti fits his style of play? Um, so there's just so many question marks in terms of what the coach is likely to do on the field and what he has in the locker room that – is it going to be more of a complete rebuild? We're going to throw everything out on a fire sale and then bring a whole bunch of new players? Or am I going to try to kind of work with what I have and maybe give myself a year uh, before I can really make some big changes? Uh, so that's kind of what my thoughts were on Dan Smith. I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit apprehensive to say this is going to be a full-on great move as as maybe some analysts and some fans have kind of commented and explained to me why they believe he's the right guy for the job uh and Caleb Porter uh I don't know he fits over there <laughs> he's a he's an old MLS guy with his own character and uh sometimes can be a little bit rough around the edges uh but I think that's a team that, unlike Charlotte, has a lot of quality players. Um, maybe gives Kayla Porter um, maybe a, a, a lot more to work with, whether he wants to play in that same style that he played in Columbus, if he wants to maybe change it up. Has he learned anything throughout this time with uh, that being a coach? Maybe he goes in with a different style. So I like that move a lot more than I like Charlotte's. Jarrett, go for it. Okay, let's talk about the coaches that are still in the league. Of, of the ones that have been uh, – that are still employed, uh, who do you think if – because we're going to do this in the early part of the season anyway – who do you think is the ones to watch for for early season hot seat action? Ooh, Ooh that, oh, that's a good question. I love that. That's a good question. I, I would put Brian Smetzer up there. Yeah. I think that if Brian Smetzer uh, this season has a lot of meaningfulness behind it, right, 50 years, uh, you think that might give him a little bit more cushion, but I think that it's going to – do the opposite is going to put all the lights, all the reflectors right upon the team. And if they're unable to have a quick start, if that locker room that has so many personalities that now are either moving on or looks like they will be moving on. Um, if he can't really manage that and that results in some lost games and inability to uh, provide the fans with that success they're used to. You're going to start hearing it from the fan base. You're going to start hearing it uh, from uh, media. Uh, 
I think we all can agree that the CCL championship and the previous success has given him some room for error, but I think that is gone. I think that he's that credit card is full. So if, if Brian Smetzer cannot start off successfully next season, I think he could be in the hot seat. Um, what's another coach that I think would be in the hot seat? Uh, I think I, I think Gary Smith. Okay. I think I think Gary Smith is a guy that uh, a lot like Brian has had a lot of lead way because he's done a lot with what initially was a little. Uh, he was able to create an identity. Uh, he took this team over and over again, far in the playoffs. But as we've talked many of times here, everybody's waiting for the next step and they haven't taken that yet. Yeah. So if he cannot have a real successful start to the season, maybe management and that owning group starts thinking perhaps it's time for us to move on, go elsewhere and start thinking about bringing in someone else. Um, and yeah, those are the two that really come to mind. What about Vanny? Ooh, uh, yeah, that's another one. Uh, that's another one. I mean, he didn't do himself any favors with, with, uh, all the shenanigans, uh, and, and outburst, uh, this season. Um, but I don't know. I, I think that he's done enough with a team that I wasn't thinking was going to be as good as they were. Uh, I think that the locker room respects him. Um, so I wouldn't put him there. I, I don't think he's maybe in a hot seat. Um, but but, but it, it could certainly change. But I, I think that he has the the right mentality for the group, the group respects him and management seems to have a real idea about the time he's going to need to turn that program around. All right, Jared, go for it. Yeah. So to your point about that, like how do you thread that needle of, Hey, we want results now versus not getting stuck in that cycle that we see so many clubs get stuck in where they're just changing managers like every year or two. And then they just kind of get stuck in that whirlpool and they can't pull themselves out. How do you, how do you avoid that mess? Yeah. Well, I think, and look, this is just me. I think it's ridiculous to sometimes spend six months, 12 interviews and seven candidates, six candidates for you to go out and give a guy a year where he has to come and work with what you have. He's going to have to uh, figure out a lot of things from uh, where players are at their best uh, culture uh, of the club and all of these things that surround putting your curriculum into effect and then fire him after a year or, or, or even less than that. You know, you go to other leagues, like Liga MX or, you know, South America, sometimes guys don't even get a year. So I think that's just ridiculous. Every time that you hire a guy, you should be confident enough in your process, in your vetting process, that if you took and you take enough time to look for the right intangibles, to look for the right fit, the right fit is huge. So you don't end up with a Frank DeBoer or, uh, you know, you don't end up with uh, a guy like uh, Lasada that seems to be over and over again, brought in, talked to, interviewed. And then when me, you, uh, Jared, my mom, we all know the way he's about, they're like, oh, uh, what are you doing, man? Well, we're going to have to let you go because you're just too intense. I mean, you knew that coming on. So I, I just think that regardless of who you hire, you got to give them at least a two-year trial, at least a two-year trial, and then figure out if what he's done is enough. And, and unless there's something outrageous or scandalous or and we've had those in MLS as well where a guy says something they shouldn't say or he's doing things he shouldn't be doing then you kick him out the door but other than that you got to give a coach enough time to build his system and see if he can take it to the promised land now we still have a couple of openings and it's DC it's Montreal 
and, and technically still it's Minnesota because Minnesota has decided, you know, tell you what, we're going to stick with our interim right now because our sporting director isn't going to be here until after the first of the year. So we're going to stick with our interim and we're cool. Right now, Montreal has uh, interviewed uh, Laurent Cotois uh, from uh, Columbus Crew 2. They have talked to uh, Gio Savarese, and uh, they, you know, you wonder who's going to put up with all the ish that uh, that Joey Saputo delivers on a daily basis. And I think, and Bob Bradley, I think, was a, a part of this discussion too. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, Bob Bradley was uh, New England, but at the end of the day in Montreal, you've got to want to put up with Joey Saputo's ish. In D.C., there's talk that it could be Bruce Arena. We've been lobbying for John Harks ever since he left Greenville in USL League One. And for God's sake, somebody do something in Minnesota with some kind of permanence. When you look at these openings, and Chicago just decided to keep Frank Klopas, uh, you know, when you look at these openings, what are you looking at with these folks? What Do you have any kind of a vibe whatsoever on these openings and who might be jumping into these spots? Yeah, I, I really do believe that if I have to uh, put a round peg in a round hole and a square one and a square one, um, I think that out of the vacancies and I would call it the high profile candidates, um, DC United would seem to be okay with a guy like Bruce Arenas and, and not just okay, but I feel like he's a guy that gives them a little bit of a splash with some that they like to do. I understand that he's, he kind of goes away from what they've, I don't know if they've angled towards with the Wayne Rooney hire. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why I get the other names that have been being brought up. But I, I think that, because of the history of the club, because of the urgency to get some results, because DC United has turned into a bit of a of a joke. Uh, uh, you know, they, they quite honestly have not been relevant in, in quite some time, despite having a big market, you could say, in, in, in some senses, uh, the historic approach of DC United. So bringing a guy like Bruce that just seems to have – the uh, gravitas, the the you know the yeah the prestige, the prestige behind it to maybe uh one be a a, a guy that maybe players want to go play for. If I'm an MLS veteran, if I'm an if I'm in free agency, uh, even uh, he has a good report uh, with uh, many players out broad. So can he bring somebody in? Uh, I think that's important for a team like DC United. So if I had to pick, I think he's a a clear cut favorite for that for that spot. And then in Giovanni Savarese, I don't think he would fit in Montreal. Uh, and it's not just the language; it, it's just the players that are there, is the style. It's Joey um, Saputo. <laughs> it's like huh? do you, you, it's the owner. Do you want to put up with him meddling every day? Exactly. And look, Giovanni Savarese, he is a fiery guy, and he's a guy that. Although respectful, he could crash with someone who's trying to tell him what to do. He doesn't want to be the offensive coordinator or the special teams guy. He wants to be the head coach. And sometimes when you go to a lot of these teams, you might be the head coach on paper, but you're really just the special team guy because they're going to tell you who to hire, when to hire, what to do. Uh, you know, so I don't see Giovanni Savarese being someone that it's okay with putting up with that. Um, so I think Minnesota with the players that they have, with the talent, uh, with that market, um, uh, with a team that could probably benefit from a charismatic, energetic uh, guy in the sidelines that the fan base can easily identify with. And maybe you grow that because you need to grow that in Minnesota. Uh, plus just the style of players that you have there. I think he would be, the perfect candidate. Now I have not heard anything. I've been following the Giovanni Savarese tracks like Spectre Gadget, and and I, I have yet to really find where he could be landing. But but I feel like I'm doing enough 
work on the ground that maybe we'll get something within the next week, week and a half. Um, so I'm hoping that at least after Christmas, I have something at least to report on it. But I am on those tracks to figure out where a guy that I rate extremely high, like Giovanni Savaresi, can land. Jared, what's on your mind? Yeah, and you mentioned as well that 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 fit and that not being told what to do. That was my question for Charlotte: is you bring in a guy like Dean Smith, who is who is very experienced, but you have an owner in Tepper who likes to have his say in things, and I want to see how that how that clashes and how they're able to manage that relationship to have that stability. Because we were talking before you came on about the, the league pushing Toronto and Charlotte as you know, two teams that they really want to see succeed, but both of them have a lot of questions coming into this year. And it's great for the league if they're good, but they got to, they got to write their own ship in the process. Yeah. And, and I think Tapper wants them bad enough where I have no doubt in my mind where Dan Smith said, look, if I'm coming, this is exactly what I'm expecting. This is the, these are my bullet points of what I need to get done. And with the desperation from that, that Charlotte should have, because they have such a beautiful stadium. They have such a, a good brand, you know, the, for the crown. I love that. I buy that thing up. I mean, if, if I was in Charlotte and I'd be just geared up on that for the crown stuff. Uh, so it's just such a good brand and there's so much good out of it other than the roster to be quite honest, but uh, I think that they, they have wanted him for a long time. You know, there were reports that he had been there uh, in a Red Bulls game while uh, 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 it, it was still not his team, but he was visiting his kid who uh, plays soccer nearby and he came through. I think that there's been conversations and nobody would ever, you know, say that exactly because you're not supposed to do that sort of thing but i think that there's been so much desire for this guy where they might just allow him to do whatever he wants uh schedules came out and uh, <laughs> yesterday uh and you've also had some player movement up there in seattle so now that the schedule is out and you are you are stacked for home matches at the tail end of the schedule to make another zombie sounders run if it comes to that but what's the latest on player movement up there in the Pacific Northwest with Seattle? And when you start, when you stared at the schedule, what'd you think? Um, oh, okay. Let's start with the schedule. Uh, I didn't really see uh, anything outstanding aside from the fact that again, we don't get much up against inner Miami, which is sad for everybody, regardless of whether we would get to see Messi here or not, um, or even go over there. Um, I like the LAFC matchup. I think that's the one that really stands out because it's a rematch of uh, that unfortunate elimination by the Seattle Sounders here at home. I think that's one that I feel like is starting to become a really good rivalry when things with Portland have kind of died down, uh, especially now with the new coach and things like that. It's still the, the rivalry, don't get me wrong. It's still the, the rivalry, but I feel like when you lose some of those headliners and when you lose some of those protagonists, e even Gio Savarese, Gio Savarese was not someone that Brian hated and uh, Gio didn't hate Brian, but there was a little bit of a Gio owned you. He's Now that he's gone, I guess, he owned you for his time in, in, with the Timbers. Um, so th those games are always fun, but I think the LAFC matchup is is, is interesting. Uh, and in terms of player movement, uh, you know, Seattle did their thing at the MLS Super Draft. Uh, I wouldn't expect any of those guys to come in and be immediate starters. But uh, uh, Pedro de la Vega, uh, I'm told the negotiations have finally starting to look like they're going to finalize. There's still some medical uh, requirements that are going to be being uh, process here within the next week, but it looks like that's going to be a done deal. So that's going to be your new young DP. Uh, how's he going to start? Where he's going to play? What does that mean for guys like Leo Chu? Are you going to play him at the 10? Are you going to play him out wide? Uh, I would think that with you picking up Albert Rusnak's option and what he did at the 10 position, you probably will start with Albert there, meaning that the guy left out of that band of three would be Leo Chu, who would hit the bench. 
Pedro would ultimately play the left side, uh, continuing with Christian Roldana on the right side and Jordan Morris up top. I'm okay with that. Uh, Jordan Bell from um, San Luis City. Uh, that was a guy that the Seattle Sounders picked up uh, in the re-entry draft. I really like that move. I think it's a little bit underrated. Uh, I've talked to guys that have followed him throughout his time uh, with uh, the all-caps team, and they really like his athleticism. Um, he seems to be a workhorse. He seems to be versatile, where if needed, he could push out wide, uh, meaning – uh, fullback position. So he seems to have all of the Seattle Sounders check marks, versatility, coachable, athletic. Um, so I, I like that move. I'm not expecting any other bigger moves for Seattle. Uh, I know that they're looking for a DP nine striker, but uh, it sounds like something that is going to come to fruition in the summer. I would expect that move in the second window. So how Seattle can move what they currently have, it's going to give them a lot of leadway for what other moves can come about. So Javier Riaga definitely will be out before the start of the next season, in my opinion. Craig Weibel, during the end of the season press conference, told us we've had interest, we've had calls. But you're going to have to come with a real offer if you want Javier because we know he can win championships. We know that he's a, a guy that we value extremely high. So we're not going to give him for a pack of gum and some potato chips. So you better bring it. Uh, he actually said, you know, that they're coming with the thought process that we don't want him. And that's not true. We want him. It's just that there's obviously other players in front of him. So I think that he's a guy that eventually will be gone. So what do you do with that money? Uh, where do you put that in your roster? Um, and then Raul Ridius, I will stick to my guns and say that um, I talked to Brian. I asked Craig Bible directly because Brian had just said that there was going to be competition between Jordan Morris and um, Raul Ridius. And my question was, Look, in a salary cap league, it is not ideal for your $3 million salary guy to be competing for a position. I mean, once you commit to a guy for a $3 million salary, he should be your starter. Or you should think and, and hope that that's going to be the case. But that doesn't seem to be what Brian thinks. So um, I still feel like whether that works out or not, that could potentially – be a domino effect on what Seattle could do early next season, but that's what we got going on here in the Pacific Northwest. All right, before you go, what are Christmas plans, and are you hanging out with us next week, or are you taking the week off? I am not taking the week off from you guys because this is a, a terrible, awful uh, way to leave 2004 with. Me, with this flashlight looking light in front of me. I do not want that to be the last thing that our SDH family sees from Nico Moreno. Uh, so I'll absolutely make the effort and I commit to being with you guys next week. Hopefully with some, I I'm going to promise this. If it's not something a hundred percent in stone, in terms of a rumor for either Seattle or, or MLS, I will give you something that is in the works because I feel like I owe you for this episode. So I'm going to give you some really good stuff uh, next week in terms of rumors. And we'll break it here on SDH before Twitter, before everything. Uh, you are the man. El Ro at El Rolo and W at Sports Pulso at the Soccer Bar. Uh, soccer Bar coming up later today. Yes, Soccer Bar coming up later today. Uh, will give me time to get to some office or something where I could actually sit down. Uh, but yes, we have a really good one. We have Felipe Cardenas with us. Uh, we're kind of doing a post MLS uh, program. Last week we had uh, Claudio from uh, Charlotte with us. We had uh, Santiago Beltran from uh, All City. So we, we're reaching out to all of our uh, Latino journalist, analyst, to talk about the teams. Today we have Felipe and um, Abramowitz from New York City FC. I am skipping on his first name, uh, but it should be a good one. These are top of the 
crop when it comes to journalists uh, in MLS. So check that out. It's going to be a good one. And uh, Badger is saying that it was, he's requesting that you send smoked salmon pastries from Pidoshki Pidoshki. That is that is a request from, uh, from Badger. Uh huh. Absolutely, man. If, if, I, if I could get that over to you guys, that'd be, that'd be a, a great press. And I, believe me, I'm a Pidoshki guy myself. Uh, I have the luxury to at times be at lunchtime at Pike Place Market. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, th those are good. Those are good. All right, my friend. We'll catch up with you next week before we turn the calendar. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you, guys. Appreciate y'all. Have a good one. We'll see you next week. All right. That's, that's Nico. All right. Uh, we had a piece of news, Jarrett, come across our bow. Oh, God. I, no, no, no. It was one oh, that you, you know, the Bryce Washington piece. Oh, know? okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, dude. I've seen like a bunch of pieces of news today. Like uh, Houston Dash are getting a new coach. Yeah. Impacts me as a fan. Her yeah. Ron Alonzo's leaving Celtic. Yeah. Um, Celtic sitting three points back of Rangers in the uh, SWPL table. Yeah. Um, which that race should be absolutely insane again, just like it was last year. Because last, yeah, last year it came down. Last year it came down the last five minutes. Yeah. Of decision day. Uh, Glasgow City won it in the last five minutes because Rangers spit the bit. Um, that then that 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 race was insane because it came down to goal difference. Mm -hmm. Like Celtic had to bludgeon. I think it was heart or hearts or Hibs. They had to bludgeon them to get the goal difference up, uh, depending on who won. Because if Rangers won, then Celtic would have won it by like two goals on goal difference. Uh, it, but Rangers were, were drawing with Glasgow City which had Celtic winning the title and then Glasgow City scored in like the last five minutes or in stoppage time. Uh, they did an Aguero <laughs> uh, kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, that Bryce Washington news as well. North, Car hungry. North Carolina FC. Yeah. Who are now in USL Championship again. Yeah. Um, so. Y'all made me hungry, so I had to run by Bojangles and grab a pork chop biscuit. Oh. Because it's Christmas time and that's the only time they serve the pork chop biscuits. Yeah. Oh man! Is he now? That's that's not cool. Uh, St. Louis City has acquired Norwegian American right back Thomas Tutland from Hacken for a first division in Sweden for an undisclosed transfer fee, and uh, Daniel Edelman has been signed uh, by Red Bulls to a to a contract extension. So those are the uh, the the news. Uh, that we have uh, of the morning. So you, you click on latest news and ends up with news. So Daniel Edelman gets a contract extension at Red Bulls to, to be under the tutelage of, of Sandro Schwartz, who really hasn't won anything since Dinamo Moscow. Uh, midfielder to a contract extension through 27 with an option for 28. Two goals and an assist in 39 regular season matches, 32 starts last season. Placed him number 21 on the overall U20, 22 under 22 Presented by Body Armor List. So I'm guessing that was sponsored. So we'll, uh, congratulations to uh, Daniel Edelman. Uh, Colorado signed Omir Fernandez in free agency as well. So there's a bit of an egress from Red Bulls as Omir Fernandez goes to Colorado to uh, hang out with Chris Armas. So the, the, relation, the past relationship there gets to be uh, a part of everything. But Thomas Tutland from BK Hacken in the Swedish First Division uh, you know, since he's Norwegian American, uh, doesn't count against any kind of international slots. Uh, Farsh and Chops, it's pepperoni, pepperoni and extra cheese. And so, uh, Farsh is asking uh, when you watch soccer, food, and drink. So traditionally, it's uh, uh, so when you watch when you watch the soccer, what food and drink do you consume? So for me, it's traditionally it's pizza if it's pepperoni and extra cheese. It depends. Um... Yeah. Generally, if we're at the stadium, we're getting whatever we can <clears throat> to eat. Um, on the road, I'm getting something that's like, I like to get something that's more local. So like when, like when we were in Montreal, I had to have the brisket poutine. Um, right. It, it tried to wreck me, but it was really good. Um, <laughs> I have a longstanding tradition of watching uh, the Champions League final at home, not with other people, but I generally go to Heirloom and get barbecue. Oh, there you uh, go. For those of you in the Atlanta area, Heirloom Market up on the northwest side of town, uh, not far from the Braves Stadium. <clears throat> um, I generally go to Heirloom to get uh, my barbecue from there. Also, they have a side dish that is basically like thinly, swi thinly sliced sweet potatoes in like a Korean barbecue, like a sweet Korean barbecue sauce that are just 
absurdly good. Um, and then for pizza, um, yeah, for pizza, I'm like it. I we lived close enough to Antico that, as you've seen, John, my my child inhales a pizza if you put ricotta on it. Yes. We go to uh, we go to Antico, and I'll generally get a, a meatball pizza, or a, a, the lasagna pizza from Antico. Oh, there you Spreads. go. Red sauce, uh, mozzarella cheese, uh, basil, uh, chunks of mozzarella, some ricotta, and some meatball. Understood. I get that. And uh, no, Farsh, I have not celebrated a kickoff by uh, uh, letting one rip. I've never done that. At least, at least consciously, I have not made a point to try to sit there and have it go right as the whistle goes. I have not tried to do that. Well, one trick also is with that pizza is Antico is great when you order it there. It's not as great when you take it to go. It, it, it the magic will the magic will seep out of the box. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. So uh, later today, we're going to catch up with our friends at uh, the USL Project down in Jacksonville. That'll be a one v one that will come out later this afternoon on the network. Uh, tomorrow should be normal. Prem and proper will be released tomorrow afternoon. Uh, Drew Dickinson has already cut his three D, and uh, so. Uh, we'll piece that together and post it, and that'll be up on the network on uh, Friday afternoon. On the uh, weekend, it will be, once again, no show on Monday. So what we're going to do this weekend is we are going to let you uh, listen to a lot of uh, programming from the past. There'll be some. There'll be a lot of soccer over there because folks have requested SOTs, and the SOTs take up good chunks of the day. So if you're packing or if you just have, it's almost like a different kind of Christmas music. You know, if you're just, if you're packing, you're sitting there and you're getting your gifts together, then, you know, you've got soccer over there in the background and literally three hours go by and and you will have listened to an entire show, the the fever dream that is soccer over there. So that'll be all day Monday. We'll post some stuff this weekend and and get you through the weekend as well as we get you ready for a Christmas, but obviously no live show Monday, back live show Tuesday but it'll be taped this weekend, and a lot of a lot of the archives will uh, give you memories about things like Mauro and Wanda, who might be heading to Madrid. The next stage of uh, Mauro, Icardi, and Wanda might be going from Turkey to Madrid. So we'll get uh, we'll get up to that. Emilio says at the stadium they rotate pizza toppings. Uh, cheese needs to be limited in true Italian fashion. And by the way, thoroughly enjoyed the the throwback sweater that you wore Emilio at the at the uh, the Glads game the other day very very cool stuff so uh I'm gonna go ahead and get us to this particular point of the show Jarrett since you are here with go ahead and send us home for a Thursday what he said back at it again 905 tomorrow morning